Hello everyone and welcome to Sky's Caller. Wow, today is already the 20th anniversary of placing this ad in the New York Times. That was the beginning of my quest to alter our understanding of astrophysics, including the nature of the sun and of the microwave background. The ad appeared on St. Patrick's Day, Sunday, March 17, 2002. That also coincided with the opening day for the March meeting of the American Physical Society in Indianapolis, Indiana. At the time, the newspaper had a Sunday distribution of nearly 2 million copies. The New York Times has different editions in different parts of the country and the world. For example, here are copies of the New England and National Edition of the newspaper for that day. If you are interested in reading the ad, it is linked below. For fun, I also provide links to the two galley proofs which were corrected just prior to the final version. I have discussed the motivation behind placing the ad previously in these two interviews. The first was with Alexander Unziker. The second was with Michael and Anastasia from Demystifying Science. Both interviews are linked below. In the end, I did four interviews for Demystifying Science, all of which are linked below. Do have a look if you have not already done so. You will learn a great deal about the problems discussed on Sky Scholar, along with a more personal perspective. In addition, Demystifying Science has many other interviews, including a recent one by the leader of the Parker Satellite Mission to the Sun. Check it out. Many wonder why I spent more than a year's salary to publish this page. The truth is that there was no better way to bring the problem to light, and some things are worth paying for. I also have been advised to take this approach by someone who had trained with a Nobel Prize winner. That person, who asked not to be named, had insisted that it would be impossible to question the nature of the Sun and the CMB in the peer-reviewed literature. It was not a question of how to correct errors in science, but rather of the ability of the scientific community to accept a radically new idea. The only option was to make the ideas public with unconventional means. Remember the rule in science, say it and let others know you did. Of course, when you place an ad in the New York Times, one meets those two requirements. Many people have attacked my approaches as being unconventional. Why not just place a paper in the physics archives, for instance? But if I had placed the paper in the archives, it would have been quickly and quietly forgotten. No one would have paid any attention. Yet through the ad in the New York Times, the issue came to the forefront for many people. The ad was followed up with several articles in news outlets, including this one in the European community. The New York Times probably took a lot of heat for placing the ad. One of their reporters, Dr. James Glantz, had trained in astrophysical sciences at Princeton. He wrote this article in the Times on March 19th, linking the placing of the ad with the discussion of intelligent design in Ohio. Of course, no link existed. That was purely a fabrication of the New York Times editorial staff. In fact, when Dr. Glantz wrote to me, he asked me to outline what I believed in, intelligent design or creation. I answered, what about evolution? But the Times never changed their approach. Later that summer, on July 23rd, the New York Times devoted three pages to cosmology, as one can see here. In that report, they quote the famous words of the Russian physicist Professor Lev Landau, who famously stated, Cosmologists are often wrong, but never in doubt. Since I lived in Columbus and worked at OSU, this article was written by David Lohr and appeared in the Columbus Dispatch on March 19, 2002. The article stated that I was an assistant professor at the time, when in fact I was a tenured full professor. For his article, David interviewed Mark Pinsonneau, a well-known solar physicist at Ohio State, who had trained with John McCall at Yale. Dr. Pinsonneau was a strong proponent of the standard model. Here is an excerpt from that article. This is way off in left field, said Marc Pinsonneau, a specialist on the structure and evolution of the Sun. What he is proposing violates every observable measure you can make about the Sun. Pinsonneau said that if the Sun were liquid throughout with a constant temperature, it would collapse upon itself in about 30 minutes. 
he doesn't address the most basic feature of stellar astronomy, the fact that the Sun isn't collapsing, Pinsonneau said. After the New York Times ad was placed, Dr. Pinsonneau was kind enough to let me audit his two advanced courses in stellar structure and evolution. I made a point to attend every lecture and read all the assigned materials. The courses both started the same way, with the presumption that the Sun could be treated as an ideal gas. No evidence was ever presented as to why this was valid. The ideal gas equation was simply assumed and the mathematical consequences immediately followed. In the ideal gas models, the stars are prevented from collapsing on themselves either through radiation pressure or through electron gas pressure as we already saw here. The problem with Dr. Pinsonneau's quote in the Columbus Dispatch is that he never considered the consequences that the Sun would be essentially incompressible through the presence of an organized lattice if it was a liquid. This is something that James Jeans recognized long ago when he treated liquid stars, as I described in this paper. The famous Nobel laureate Chandrasekhar himself also accepted the essentially incompressible nature of the stars should they be liquids. He devoted nine years of his life to the study of rotating liquid spheres, as one can learn in this text. Relative to the observational evidence, Dr. Pinsonneau never presented a single line of evidence supporting his claim that the standard model is correct. In fact, all the evidence actually points to condensed matter, as has now been well manifested on this channel in numerous videos. In any event, the day the New York Times article appeared, many were struggling to get their hands on a copy of the article at the American Physical Society meeting in Indianapolis. Professor John Wilkins later remarked that physicists were both amazed and in awe at the courage involved. John was my friend and a distinguished professor in the Department of Physics at OSU and an Ohio eminent scholar. He was also one of the most eminent condensed matter physicists in the world. He was an avid reader of the New York Times, and those who knew him well knew that he never started his day without reading his Times. John was attending the APS meeting at the time, and he was shocked as everyone else to see that the ad was placed. In the end, the full page ad in the New York Times was just an opening move on my part. The story was far from over. I remained unconventional not only in my use of the New York Times, but also in my recourse to publishing in progress in physics and in utilizing YouTube. However, when a paradigm shift is involved, one cannot expect to follow the usual course of action in science. John recognized this. He sometimes joked about physicists deliberately placing their papers in obscure journals for two reasons. First, if they were correct, they could keep working without anyone actually realizing that a great discovery had already been made. Once proven right, they could easily claim priority. Secondly, if they were wrong, no one would know they had made an error. In any case, my position has always been just to get the idea out there and let others consider the details. It is a battle for ideas, and once ideas come out, they have a tendency to mature. The concept that the stars have lattice structure is difficult to accept at first, but after careful consideration, one comes to recognize that it is the only logical conclusion which can account for the solar spectrum and the presence of a true solar surface at the level of the photosphere. The stars are condensed matter, and that realization is well worth the cost of a full page in the New York Times. Now I realize that some of my supporters were not even born when the New York Times article was published. In addition, many were either too young or unaware that the event had even taken place. As a result, I have decided to give away one copy of the first section of the New York Times for that day. Just send an email to this address, which is also located at the bottom of the New York Times ad. Your name will be entered for free in a drawing, and I hope to announce the winner by April 7th, the 5th anniversary of Sky Scholar. Good luck! Well, that is all for now. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on our next video.